Please join me in welcoming Bill Ballou. Okay, you don't have to. You know, I didn't do anything yet, so I wouldn't clap until I was finished. So I am going to do something that, as far as I know, has never been done before. And I'm going to do it just for you. Now, the reason I say that is about five, six weeks ago, I came to this room. The tour brought me up here. I stood here, and I looked, and I closed my eyes. And during the time I was preparing for this talk, many times I closed my eyes, and I tried to imagine who would be sitting here. And it was you. I'm not bringing something else and hoping that you will be interested. I am bringing something for you and hoping that other people may be interested. And if they are not, that's OK, too. This talk is for you. Now, the reason I say to, as far as I know, nobody's ever done this before, is I'm almost 60 years old. Three months from now, I'll be 60 years old. And I'm a churchgoer. So in 60 years, I've been to church almost every week, probably every week, more than once a week. So 60 times 50, that's about 3,000, maybe 4,000. Without exaggeration, I've heard maybe 5,000 talks. I have probably given 2,000 talks. I go to conferences the same as you do. And I hear these talks all of the time. And so I'm pretty sure somewhere between 7,000 and 10,000 talks I have heard or given. And nobody has ever done what I'm going to do today. We hope it will work, right? So the idea for what I'm going to do today came from my children. My oldest son is a piano player. And I think he's very good, but then all parents will think their kids are good. Well, he writes these piano pieces. And if you listen to them very carefully, you will hear that there are two songs going on out of sync. They're not matching together. So you'll hear two songs going, one here, one there, right? So it's called counterpoint. So you play a song, and then there's another song that, ah, oh, I can hear that too. Well, and then my other son is a scientist, and he's he, he's a biologist by scientist, so he knows how wonderfully the body will work together. You know, my right hand doesn't know what my left hand is doing. Sometimes I can write and listen and tap my foot while listening to music at the same time. They're all not together, but they all work together, right? And then I have a, I have a six-year-old. You say, what, what is a 60-year-old man doing with a six-year-old? Well, that's none of your business. But, but I do have a six-year-old. And she also, how many of you have seen the movie Let, uh, Frozen? <laughs> Where have you been? Frozen, let it go, let it go, right? Well, Anna is singing one song, and Elsa is singing another song. And you can hear them going, depending on which side of the, you listen out of, right? So there are two things always going on at the same time. But they match, or more or less. So I'm going to try. No, I'm not going to try. I'm going to give you two talks at the same time. Hmm. One of them is going to be on the slides. Just watch the slides. The other one is going to be what I say. They're not going to be the same, but they will be somewhat the same. But they're not going to be the same. So if your thing is watching and not listening, then just watch. There will be 15 points that if you do only those 15 points, you will be able to communicate. You will be able to talk to anybody from any country in the world. Just do those 15. And they should be pretty easy to understand just by looking at them. And if you want to be really, really good, do more than those 15. So just pick one. Just do that. If you just do that, uh, you will be able to talk across any country. If you do two of them, you'll be really good. If you do three of them, you'll be really, really good. But if you do 15, you'll be really, 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 really good. I think that was 15. I'm not quite sure. So just watch the 15. Write those down. Go home and master those. Make that what you want to do. And no matter what culture you go to, they will understand what you're saying. Now, if watching is not your thing, but listening is, I'm going to tell you three stories. I will tell you three stories. Do you know the number one reason why people are bad speakers? There's a one reason that, that's bigger than all of the other reasons put together. There's one reason why people are very bad speakers. And I know this because I have interviewed 
I have talked to people from China. I've talked to people from Korea. I've talked to people from Indonesia. I've talked to people from South America. I've talked to people from I don't know how many different countries. And I ask them this question. And I get the same answer. When I ask people, if you could speak another language. So they come, I want to learn English, Bill. OK, that works for me. So if you could speak English, and you understood and were, could speak it perfectly, what would you say? Yeah, you see, there's, there's, the, there's the point here. I've asked 1,000 people, I've asked 2,000 people, if you could speak my language perfectly, what would you say? And they say, nothing. Because they don't have what it is they want to say. You see, if you don't know what you want to say, you're not going to be able to say it. If you have something you want to say, you will find a way to say it. It always works that way. Now, I've come up with three steps. Three different steps. I will call them levels, but we'll call them steps. Three different steps. There are things that people want to say. There are things that people need to say. And then there are things that people have to say. They are different. The things that people want to say will live on the tip, on the end of their tongue. The things that people need to say will dig inside their belly. I, I, and then the things that people have to say, it will burn in their bones. It's different. So I'm going to tell you three stories. So we'll go through, watch the slides, or listen, or try to do both. You guys are smart. You should be able to do that, right? Is anybody here besides me? Yeah, you can do that. So I was in Bangkok. And there was a room. There were probably not more than 20 people in the room at the same time. And in those 20 people, 12 or, 12 or 14 of them all came from a different country. And they were sitting there. They're talking in English back and forth, back and forth. They're talking to each other. And they're saying, we have written something, but nobody will read it. We have written this paper. We have written this, this story. But we can't get anybody to read this story for us. What are we going to do? So their solution, their, their, their answer to that problem was, let's just share with each other and pass it around. And then hopefully people will pay us to do that. Well, good luck with that. Let me know how that works. And so they complained. They argued so much. I have this material. I don't know how to, what to do with it. I could not take it anymore. I said, don't you people know about Google? No, I'm serious. So you don't know what you do, but I know how it plays out on the other side. So I said, don't you know about Google? Google has made it possible. Seriously, I'm running around the world telling about you guys. Thank you very much for what you do. If you write something good, you can put that on the internet, on this magic whatever, and people will find it and read it. And they thought, wow. I cannot give stuff away for free. Are you crazy? Why would I give it away for free? I cannot give something good away for free. How will I make money doing that? I know the answer to that question, you see. And so I now travel the world telling people how to use what it is you have made. Thank you very much. You've given me a job. Well, a year after that, I went to Kuala Lumpur, and there were the same kind of people, some of the same people, but there were other people in there, and they were mad. And they hate you. Google has stolen all of my stuff, and now they have put it where anybody can read it, and nobody will give it to me. Nobody will pay me for anything. You are a thief. Shame on you. Did you steal from these people? They know, of course they know. Maybe you did. Maybe I, I, I've caught them. <laughs> so you see, and now they're mad. You have stolen all of this stuff, and you're giving it away to everybody, and we cannot make any money for that. Well, see, this is what I get to do. I said, no, that's not how it works. Let me tell you how you can write very good stuff. And you can put that in a place where people can use their computers to find you and read you. And if you're good, you will make money at that. Well, isn't that interesting? So in the process of doing all of these things, 
I have learned a simple step-by-step -step that if I do these five things, I can beat anybody at anything. I can beat anybody at anything. So how do you do that? Now, I thank you for the lessons because you taught me this. It starts with telling stories. I tell stories. You have a problem. You don't know how to fix that problem. I know how. And I fix the problem for you. And the more I tell the story about how I can fix your problem, the bigger, the better, the stronger, the hero I am. What's your problem? Let me solve that problem. Let me fix that problem for you. And when I fix it, I will be your champion. I will be your hero. Well, that's the basics. I tell stories. And if I tell that story more than anybody else who tells the same kind of story, I can beat them. So if I tell a story and I tell it more, and then I have to tell it better. You see, you, you guys are tricky. You guys are... You see, you cannot just throw up junk. You cannot throw trash. You have to give something good before people will search and find something good. So I have to tell it better. I tell stories, I tell more, I tell it better, and I tell it more often. And if I tell that story more often, I will beat anybody. And then there's one more step. You see, people get tired. You ever get tired? Yeah, nobody gets in. Are you tired? Yeah, we get tired. Everybody gets tired. Well, when I'm in my workspace, there are other people trying to do the same thing I do. And I know that they get tired because I get tired and everybody gets tired. So when the person you're trying to beat gets tired, don't get tired. And you'll beat them. Tell good stories, solve real problems for real people in the real world, in the real locations that get the real end result. Tell it a lot, tell it better, tell it often, and tell it longer. And you can beat anybody at anything. So thank you for the job. Thank you for giving me something to do. Oh, lost my screen. Thank you for letting me, for giving me employment. So if you cannot, tell people. Well, we can always show them, right? If I just show them, they'll be able to see what it is we're going to do. And I keep telling that story. Now, the bottom line here is, when you are people's hero, they like you. Because I can fix what is wrong. So people are terribly, uh, what's the word? They, they don't quite get it. They think if I sit in a room and create if I make something really well, all of the world will come to see what I made. Well, let me know how that works for you. You see, there, there comes that point where I have made something, and now I need people to find that for me. And that's where you come in. If, if you think that you can do something in your room, and all the world will come and find you, it won't work. We call that looking at things with googly eyes. Googly eyes. But what we want to know what I teach people is how to look at the world through Google's eyes. You see the difference? There's googly eyes and then there's Google's eyes. So if I learn how to write good stuff for real people that gets real, raw, real results, I can be found. I know that, and I thank you for letting me do that. Well, that's something I want to tell people. I want to tell people how to become a hero. Well, now there are some things that I need to tell people. I need to tell people. I was in Japan. I lived in Japan for almost 20 years. And while I was in Japan, I went off to Russia and taught for a while. I visited China for a while. I visited Korea for a while. I visited several different countries as a visiting teacher. They come teach us. And so I'm, I'm in Japan. And my boys, both of my boys, are made in Japan. It says, made in Japan here. We just don't show that to people. My daughter's made in China, but with American parts. What can I say? And so my boys were nine years old and six years old, and they were going to Japanese school. One day, they came home from school with tears. What's wrong? What's wrong? Well, Papa, when we were at school today, everybody was calling us half. You are half. 
their Japanese friends were telling them. You are only half of what we were doing. Well, don't you know, I was prepared for that. They came home and said, we are just half. Well, so Benjamin is my oldest son. Micah is my younger son. I said, let me ask you some questions. When you go to Japanese school, do you understand your Japanese teacher? Mm, yeah. Do you understand your, your, the comic books? Do you understand the books that you read? Well, yes. How about when you watch Japanese on the TV? Can you follow? Yes, I can do that. And do you like Japanese food? Well, sure we do, sure we do. What about grandma? Can you talk to grandma in Japanese? Well, of course I can. So what about when you go to America? When you go to America, can you do those things? Do you eat American food? Yeah. Do you like American books? Yeah. Do you watch American television? Yeah, I like all of these things. And can you play with American friends? Yes, yes, I can do all those things. And how about your grandma? Can you talk to your grandma and grandpa in America in English? Well, of course we can. Yes, we can. So now let's go back to Japan. Let me go back to Japan. How about your Japanese friends? Can they eat Japanese food? Well, yeah. Can they watch Japanese television? Yeah. And so on and so on. So what about when your Japanese friends go to America? Can they watch Japanese, uh, American television? No. Can they read English books? No, they cannot do that. Can they talk to your American friends? No, they can't do that either. And what about your grandma? Will they play with your grandma in English? No, no, they cannot do any of those things. So that's Benjamin Micah. Who is half of whom? You see all of their friends who had been calling them half. They were the half. Because they, and then I said, Benjamin, Mike, I'll tell you what. You guys are not half anymore. From now on, you're doubles. You're doubles. Well, that was fun. So what I did at the time, there, there was a, a newsletter. Remember people who used to write and put it on paper and put it in mailboxes and send it around? Remember those days? Maybe some of you don't. Yeah, there, there was that. Well, I was a, a writer for one of these newsletters that traveled throughout Japan. And so I wrote about that experience. I wrote about that day with my children. You're not halves, you're doubles. And it went throughout all of Japan. Now, it was not a huge, pop, it was not a big group, but it was the right group. Because two weeks later, three weeks later, in a national newspaper, the country newspaper, there was a don't call these children half anymore. Let's call them doubles. And suddenly, everybody in Japan who came from two different countries were not half of anybody. They were double everybody else. And then about two weeks after that, we're watching television. And there's some singer ah, you know, screaming and whatever they do. And the interviewer comes out. The man comes out with and He says, how do you like being a half in Japan? He said, don't call me half. Call me double. And now that word moves throughout Japan. And now it moves in its way into China as well. And see, and I know where that word came from. Because I made it. It was never said before then. I never heard it said before then. I never knew anybody talked like that before. I never got the idea from anybody. I just sat there waiting for my children to come home. I sat there and waited for my children to come home and ask me the question, why do people call me half? That's something I needed to tell them. That is something I needed to tell them. It's not the same as I want to tell them. It's not the same. So there is a, another step. And this one is things that I have to say. Well, what could that be? I was in Russia. I was in Russia. I was teaching a class. This was during the Cold War. It was still 1989. And I'm teaching a class. There are probably this many people in the classroom. They asked me to come teach them how to teach English. They, they were Russian. They're very, very good. Some of them had spoke English better than I did. Well, and here I am teaching this class. And a man in a black suit comes in with a little girl and yellow hair. It looked like Boris and Natasha. I don't know if you know from Maxwell Smart, right? It, he was a KGB agent. He was a secret policeman. And I know that because everybody in the room began to whisper, KGB, KGB. And when everybody in the room whispers, KGB, KGB, 
I can hear them. Right? Try it. Everybody try it. KGB. Okay. Yeah, you see, we can hear that. And so after I taught that class, the KGB man came up to me with his little girl. He said, Bill, Bill, I want to take you out to meet a witch. Well, I've never met a KGB agent. And now I get to meet a witch also. And they put me in a car, and they drove me out into the darkness. Have you ever seen the movie White Nights? White Nights. I, I see a head. If you have not seen the movie, go home, watch the movie White Nights. Rishnikov, the ballet dancer, right? He escapes from Russia. He runs away from Russia. The word defect. He runs away from Russia. And Gregory Hines goes the other way to Russia. Well, at the end of the movie, Gregory Hines, he's a tap dancer. He's in a black sedan. He's in a black car. And they're driving him out. And you think, he is dead. They're going to kill him. That's what happened to me. It was the exact, I'm in a black car. It's pitched, I mean, it's very, very dark. And they're taking me out into the, in, into the darkness. I'm going to die. I was sure I was going to die. And the only thing I could think of, I hope I meet the witch before I die. <laughs> Otherwise, why am I doing this? Well, when I met the witch, we had this, 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 this talk going back and forth. And the questions she asked me were the same questions I was asked just two weeks before. I was in Moscow. Moscow is the only Russian word I know, and that's not even said Moscow. It's Moscow, right? So I am in Russia. I'm in Russia. I'm in the, I'm in Red Square, right in the very heart. There's a big red wall and a big yellow building on the other side. There's dead Lenin. He's dead right there. And on the other side of the wall, there is a school called the Moscow High Party School of Communism. The Moscow High Party School of Communism, and never never had an American been inside that school before. They invited me. Well, that's cool. I get to go inside the Moscow High Party School of Communism. Well, they couldn't just let me go. So they had to change my name from William to Ulian, <laughs> from Belu to Belov. And then the middle name was Ivanovich. It should have been Leonardovich. But so I'm Ulian Ivanovich Belov. And they took me in there, and I just go on in, and they took me to a room where I met a professor whose job it was, I met a professor whose job it was to tell the world what is communism. He had his fingers in the entire world of communism, and I was invited to talk to him. Well, the first day, we were talking and talking, and he just comes after me. Ah, I'm just an English teacher. Help, help. And he wants to know what's better. Is it feudalism, where people rule people? Is it imperialism, where countries rule others? Is it nationalism, where countries rule countries? Is it capitalism, where money controls everything? Or is it Marxism, where there's this big idea where everything is going to be OK? Or is it communism, where we will decide what is good, and you will like it? So he wants to decide which of these systems are the best. I don't even know what he's talking about. But we spent a good five hours going back and forth, back and forth, talking about these different ideas. Well, I went back home that night feeling pretty sad about life, because he's smarter than me. right? He knows things I don't know. He said, can you come back again the next day? And he did. He said, Bill, come back. So I went back to the very same room. And I come to find out that this is most likely the very room where Lenin and Stalin and these guys got together and sat and decided this is how communism should play out. I'm in the very same room. And he looks at me and says, Bill, it's your turn to decide what we will talk about. Well, I have the man who can touch the entire communist world sitting before me. And he says, what do you want to talk about? Well, now, if you were asked that question, you asked that question in that situation, what would you say? What are you going to say? Well, this is how you do coding. 
over at Google, we have, <laughs> what, what, what are you going to say? Well, I was ready for this. I was ready for this because I have something that burns in my bones that I have to share. So he's looking at me. He's sitting there very quietly, and it's my turn to say something. And this is the first time I have ever started a fight that I was prepared to lose. You see, I, this is the first time I started a fight that I was prepared to lose. So I said, OK, let's talk about God. OK, he says, how do you know there's a God? And I began to talk. And I talked for some 45 minutes. And I went through this reasoning, and I went through this. I just kept on going. 45 minutes later, he said nothing. So I continued to talk. And not only is there a God, this God has written a book. And that book is now ours to read. And he says, how do you know this book is from God? Well. I got into the middle of that, and I talked for another 45 minutes, maybe an hour, just going. You know, this is how I know these things to be true. And when I got done, he said nothing. So I continued to talk. Yeah. And don't you know that this God who made the world, and I'm wondering, why does he fight back? This God who has made the world, he has given us a book so that we can know who that is. He has also came to us in a person. He's, he became a person. Who is that person, he said. And I told him who that person was. And how do you know this person? How, uh, Jesus, how do you know? How do you know these things? And so I went into history, and I talked for another 45 minutes. It was I, I, That's beyond what we're talking about here. but. Let me give you an example. In his office, there was a calendar. There was a calendar. And so I said, do you see the calendar? He said, yeah, I see the calendar. I said, you know, a year is once around the sun, right? A month is the moon, once around the, the moon takes a lap. A day is when the Earth spins. What are we to understand about a week? How did a week come to be? Well, that's interesting. You, you can look that one up. And then I looked at the calendar again. It says 1989. 1989. What happened 1,989 years ago? Why do we go from here to zero and then back to 1989? What is in the middle? Well, I don't know. I said, you need to go find that out. Well, I told him because it was my turn to talk. And then I'm looking at the same calendar. And I said, look, there is Sunday. Sunday is in red. Why is Sunday in red? Well, I learned some Russian. You know, there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Monday through Sunday. Well, it's got Panagelnik, Thornik, Streda, Chetvier, Pyrnitsa, Subota, Subot, Sabbath, Subota. And then Sunday is Voskresenye. I asked him, I said, Mr. Professor, what does the word Voskresenye mean? It means resurrection. Well, isn't that interesting? For thousands of years or hundreds of years, they've been calling Monday or Sunday Resurrection Day. And then he began to get it, you see. And then I finally finished talking. And I looked at him, and he, I said, what do you have to say? Because it's his turn to fight. He could have fought. He, he put his head down. I said, what do you have to say? He looks back, and the words he uses are, ochin interesna, interesna. It sounds like interesting. Very interesting, he says. And I said, I know it's very interesting, but what do you have to say? He said nothing. What's wrong here? Tell me something. Fight back. Tell me where I'm wrong. Show me where it's wrong. And we went home, friends. Well, not two weeks after that, barely two weeks after I sat in the office with him, the Berlin Walls came down. They did. The Berlin Wall. That's just two weeks after that is when that all began to happen. Now, I probably didn't do that. <laughs> but you can tell it. You can blame me if you want to. You can say, Bill did that. Bill did that. 
Yeah, ah, it was great. You see, when, when I am able to talk to people of other countries, you see, I can touch people in their business life. I can touch my children and see their lives change. And if I'm really good, I can touch the world if I just touch the right people. Well, I want to know what it is you want to say. So some of you are watching this on the streaming. Hey, some of you will watch this later. Some of you are sitting here. Well, I want, to, I want to know what do you want to tell people. Write that down. Send it to me. Put it in the comments. What do you need to tell people? Tell me what that is. What do you have to tell people? When you find the answer to those three questions, you will find a way to be able to communicate to more people. You will find a way to translate, um, translate to, to talk to, to more and more people. See, what did I forget? Ah, the witch. Yeah, and the gun. They had a gun. I'm sitting in this car on my way out to meet this witch. And they said, Bill, there's something we did not tell you. So, okay. He said, there are some black magic people. And those black magic people have a gun. And with this gun, they can shoot waves. And if it hits you, they will control how you think. And I'm thinking, if it is not me, I will not believe what they are saying but I'm in the car and they're telling me they can shoot you with the gun and they can control how you're thinking. So I'm sitting in the back seat, Sergey is here and Boris is over there. I said, Sergey, ask Boris if he's pulling my leg. Sergey says, huh? I says, ask Boris if he's pulling my leg. Sergey said, what, what? I said, pulling my leg. Says, Bill, how can he pull your leg? You're sitting here, he's sitting there. No, is he kidding me? Is he joking? No, 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 we have this gun and we can shoot people. And I'm thinking, shoot me. I know, I think I'm telling them, shoot me with the gun. I am not afraid. I do not think so deeply. So what can happen? Shoot me with the gun. Well, we met those people. They never shot me with the gun. But we ended up at the witch's house. We ended up at the witch's house. And I was, you know, she was kind of short, kind of round, looked like a, like a fire plug, you know, for fighting fires. And, she looked at me and she says, Bill, I want you to help me fight black magic. Will you help me? Well, that's another story on another day that I would like to tell you about, but this goes again beyond this. But she asked me three questions. How do you know God made the world? How do you know he talked to us through this book? And how do you know he became a person? And I know the answers to those questions. But what I'm looking for here is how to tell these stories that I want to tell, how to tell these stories that I need to tell, how to tell these stories that I have to tell with as few words as possible. And if I did my job correctly, I have used only 800 words in this entire talk, in, in this whole talk. And if I stepped outside of those 800 words, I was able to explain the words that I was not, you, you see, there's 800 words. You, with 800 words, I can touch people's lives. With 800 words, I can change my children's lives. And with 800 words, I can change the world. If you could change the world, why would you not change the world? Thomas Edison said about Henry Ford, Thomas Edison said about Henry Ford, we cannot be sure whether what Henry Ford did was good or bad. But Henry Ford did not leave things the way he found them. Yeah. If you could change the world, why would you not change the world? And all you need to change that world are those 800 words. 800 words. This is what we call the, the wow factor. I can touch the world. So we know the, the 1 800, right? 1 800? 800 numbers you call, then you can talk to anybody. Well, with 800 words, 
I can now change the world. So this is my, my, my call to action to you. What are you going to do that makes the world a different and better place? How are you going to change the world? Thanks for letting me be here. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you sharing your lunch with me. Thank you very much. So how, how did I come to have these 800 words? All right, so this was back before, you got, before Google was even, any, well, no, actually it was. It was like 1991, was it? When was, when does Google found it? 93, well this is back in 89 or so. And so I actually did it a little bit before then. I was teaching university. I had a bunch of students who were really stupid and they needed extra work to do. So I gave them extra work to do. So what we did was we watched movies we watched 50 different movies. In each of those 50 movies, we wrote out the dialogue on all those 50 movies by hand. And you know, exactly, we wrote them out all by hand. And then each of those students who were failing, they didn't know English, but they could count. So I said, now just go through and circle all the words, circle all the does, circle all the whens, circle all the is's, and, and let's list them all up. So I had 50 students over three years watch 50 movies and list up all these words in most frequently ordered. There are about 612 words, 612, 613 words. It depends how you group them together. But with those 612 words, I can talk about 86% of everything I want to say, I can say with 612 words, not 800, 600. About 7% of all movies are names, places. Let's go to Cincinnati, you know, let's go kill people in South Africa. You, you cannot, you have to learn them. And then another, 12, not 12, but 8% or so. I forget the exact numbers. It's, it's in the book, whatever. I'm not going to sell you a book. But I'll send you the list if you give me your, your email. So another 8% of all words in a, in a movie is only used one time. The, the word pops up and it's never used again. Don't touch that detonator. You will, you will die. Well, I don't know what it is, but if I touch it, I'll die. So it's something that dies people or you know, kills people. So we can understand. That's how we learn words, by using the 600, using the 800, to be able to define those things. So I, uh, I want to encourage you to find, you know, develop, create, build on those 15. If you're just an expert at what you do, just be really, really good at what you do. And people will find a way to understand. Uh, that's, that's easy. And then we build on that. If I cannot tell, if I don't master words, well, I can show people. That's why I create a deck and so on. So add up those 15. Pick and choose the ones you like. Use the ones you want to use, right? And add to those, those 800 words, and you can change the world. So uh, as engineers, we often uh, talk in a you know, techy way where we have a lot of words to explain something. So do you have any suggestions on how to you know, make our talk, like our presentation more uh, essence, uh, essential? You know, any, any, what do you, you know, mean, tips? Is I mean, how to um, make your talk, uh, make our talks or presentations uh, in, in a condensed way? Well, see, I can connect those techie terms. I can connect to that techie expertise. Whatever it is you're trying to do, all of those words, all of those ideas, all of that job is connected by these 800 words. Right? So here I need to do this, well I need to do that. And that's where the show me tells me. So if I can show and I can connect to those 800 words, I can tell anybody anything. Does that make sense? Is that Thanks. The problem is we try to overwhelm people with how smart we are, and we use different words. Yeah, you, you travel a lot, you know, over Asia. So just compare your Asia culture and here is, uh, uh, can you put some comment on huh? when you say deliver some message, to, do we need to be a very culture sensitive? Or is there any, you know? Culturally sensitive, well, when you go to Asia, to speak to a professional group, you don't wear shorts. No, I'm kidding. Ah. I, I, th I think it comes down to people are people everywhere. And what they want to know is what is in your heart that connects to what's in my heart? So it, it becomes, you know, we don't have to worry about cultural gaps. We don't have to worry about cultural gaps. All I need to be is to consider what it is that I have to share, what it is that I need to share. So I'm back to the very basic, what I want to, what I need to, what I have to. 
And when people begin to understand those different levels, all of that culture breaks down. You know, every culture loves their children, for example. Every culture, people want to do a good job. They want to be experts at what they do. Every culture wants to have that charisma. They all, everybody wants to be liked. And, see, and those things don't change. How that plays out is different. But those elements of those, those 15 that I'm sharing with you, those are the same in every culture. So what I want to do is I want to pick one or two or three or all of those 15. And there are, there are some more. I want to pick one, two, three, or all of those 15. And I want to be able to connect those 15 with 800 words to anybody. And I don't have to be overwhelmed. I don't have to think too hard about it. In one of the slides, you mentioned the, the, you use a Google Eye. It's a Google kind Look of at the world through Google's yeah, through eyes, eye. right. But it, like, say, in China or Russia, there's some t local right, search engine. Can I use Baidu and Yandex here? With yeah, that? yeah, that's okay. it. You can talk about So that's uh, is the same, same thing, you the, feel? The or principles, princi so I'm, I'm outside of my 800 words here. Is that OK? So the, the, the rules are the same. You know, we are looking for people who can satisfy my problem. So at the very basic level, there is a person who wants something. But there is a problem in the way. And so they're looking for the fix to that problem. And they will do that with the index. They will do that with Baidu. They will do that with Dogpile. They will do that especially with you know, Google and Bing. I hope I don't get in trouble. You see, it's I have this problem. Who can solve this problem for me? And the more problems I can solve, the better the expert I am. Now, see, I, I, don't, I don't say just throw a bunch of stuff. No, we don't throw a bunch of stuff. I, we want to solve real problems for real people who need real answers in real locations so that they can make real changes to their life. And it works the same. I, I understand that Baidu is about three years behind Google. Uh, you know the end. You tell me. I don't know. How many years is Baidu behind? <laughs> you can make up something and we won't know the difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, I just feel maybe the, uh, the, the kind of pretty much control, right? You know, a little bit uh, self censored some information. So that's uh, different. Maybe the. I say, I, if the, you want me to talk about censorship, I'll just get myself in trouble. Yeah. Uh, right? You know, different, different countries have different rules. So we play by the rules of the different countries. Now, I, you know, I, I don't want to start a discussion. That's beyond the scope here. But you know, the, the old saying, when in Rome, you know, in Japanese we say, go nishtagao, go niriba, go nishtagao. It's the same thing. When you're in go, do like goins. So there's a reason why that proverb has been around for a very long time, because that's how we should do things, I think. All right, thank well, you thank you very coming. much for sharing your and time with me. Let's uh, thank the speaker again.